I was 35 years old before I realized that one of the best vacation spots in the country was only about a four hour drive north of Jeffersonville. Lake Michigan, surrounded by its beautiful sandy beaches, yet hundreds of miles from the ocean, is a great weekend getaway. Not far from the northern Indiana border is the big city of Chicago, with a beautiful harbor on Lake Michigan. Chicago has one of the most amazing skylines with towering skyscrapers, mirrored glass buildings, incredible architecture, and more. Best of all, visitors can take in the breathtaking view while lying in the sand and sipping ice-cold drinks on the beach nearby. Afterward, visitors can stroll down the busy streets of Chicago, sampling some Chicago-style pizza, loaded hot dogs, and sizzling hot fries. Standing in downtown Chicago, the buildings are so massive that you begin to wonder how they stand on their own. They look as though they'd simply collapse, crushed by their own weight. When I first visited Chicago, I was still in the message. At the time, I had no idea how significant Chicago was to the history of the religion of my family. As I began to research, however, I quickly began to learn that many trails of research led directly to Chicago. The prophet's father produced liquor that was likely distributed in Chicago. Before the Wathan liquor ring was taken down, Wathan's drivers were frequently arrested, making Chicago deliveries. It was also likely that this unusual business arrangement is the reason Wathan decided to post Charles Branham's bail money. Chicago is where the prophet visited his first World's Fair and where he got the inspiration for some of his prophecies. Chicago is home to the Philadelphia Church and Joseph Matson Bose, who would help promote the prophet. Chicago is where the prophet would hold huge healing campaigns, some of which were hosted by the infamous Reverend Jim Jones and People's Temple. The prophet's latter rain theology was heavily marketed from Chicago, from that same church. Chicago itself was the target for what the prophet claimed to be biblical prophecy when he alleged that Chicago was the city that Nahum saw by vision during a sermon that was plagiarized by Reverend C.L. Franklin. He said, That great eagle called Nahum 4,000 years ago went up so high in the Spirit of God until he saw outer drive in Chicago 4,000 years later said the chariot shall raise in the broad ways and they shall run like lightning and they shall seem like torches and they'll jostle against one another. In all the sermons that I listened to in my life from all of the pastors in the message churches that I attended, I never heard any sermon where the outer drive prophecy was mentioned. Most message pastors did not include that in their sermons, some never mentioning the prophecy at all. Those who did mention the book of Nahum realized that the prophet hadn't studied Nahum's vision very well and described the prophecy of Nahum in its correct geographical location. It is widely known that the book of Nahum focuses specifically on the end of the Assyrian Empire and its capital city of Nineveh. When a researcher thinks about Chicago during the Prohibition era, they typically think of Al Capone and organized crime. Researchers from the Louisville and southern Indiana area especially, because Capone often frequented the southern Indiana casinos and had business associates in Louisville. Considering the many times that the prophet mentioned his father and the whiskey stills in his life story accounts, one might even conclude that organized crime in Chicago helped shape the prophet's early life and to influence his ministry to promote teetotalism. Organized crime was not the only influence in the prophet's life from Chicago, however, at least not directly. The most famous early religious associate for the prophet was converted from a life in Chicago organized crime, a man by the name of E. Howard Cadle. Cadle was an evangelist from the 1920s who would influence many in the Louisville and southern Indiana area and would eventually influence multiple aspects of the prophet's ministry. 
Chicago's Levy District was infamous for its brothels, gambling, crime, and seedy locations. It was in this district where Al and Frank Capone started their brothel and gambling house, the Four Deuces. It was at the same district where E. Howard Cadle owned his saloon and gambling house. E. Howard Cadle was a businessman with strong Jeffersonville ties. His mother lived in Utica, not far from the Prophet and his family. Cadle owned casinos and slot machines in Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky. He was born just north of Louisville in the town of Salem, Indiana. About the time that Al Capone moved from New York to Chicago, however, E. Howard Cadle suddenly got religion and left gambling altogether. He moved his base of operations to Indianapolis, Indiana, and then set out to begin building a religious empire instead of nightlife. Cadle wanted to create a network of churches and began focusing his attention towards Louisville and southern Indiana. When Indiana became a dry state in 1919, Cadle began an evangelistic campaign in Louisville's business district, shortly after prohibition laws were passed. In January of 1920, Cadle announced that Louisville was chosen for his main tabernacle and that others were soon coming. Cadle wanted to erect a chain of tabernacles throughout southern Indiana and Kentucky. By June of that same year, Cadle's new tabernacle was built. He became known to the locals as the Tabernacle Man. Cadle's combination of business strategy and religion was highly successful, as was his life story which he frequently retold. It attracted the attention of big-name evangelists such as Gypsy Smith. Cadle's crime to Christianity story would have been very appealing. I became curious about this conversion, however, and I wondered if this was a normal Christian conversion story. Something about the timeline of E. Howard Cato's conversion made me curious. I thought about his ties to Jeffersonville and Chicago, which coincided with the time that Charles Branham was producing liquor for Otto Wathen. I thought about his sudden flight from Chicago during mob control. I considered the fortune he accumulated almost overnight and his ambition to establish a chain of Indiana churches. Knowing that Jeffersonville became a battleground between Ku Klux Klan and distilleries, I began to wonder about E. Howard Cadle leaving the saloon business. Was it a clean break, as he claimed, after he got religion? Or did he switch sides during the heat of the battle? Examining the timeline, I found that E. Howard Cadle's sudden rise to fame coincided with another historical event. While E. Howard Cadle was boasting about his overnight growth in Indiana, the Ku Klux Klan was boasting about their plans of expansion. They began parading through the streets of cities and states all across the nation. In an unprecedented event, the Klan marched on Washington, D.C. in 1920, the same time Cadle was planning his network of churches throughout Indiana. With the knowledge that the Prophet started his career as an assistant to a high-ranking member of the Klan, I began to wonder, how does E. Howard Cadle fit into the picture? How did the rise of the Indiana Klan fit into the picture? Was E. Howard Cadle a member of the Ku Klux Klan? Things began to move quickly after the Indiana Klan was formed. E. Howard Cadle acquired a permit to build a massive tabernacle in the state capital of Indianapolis. It was almost 40,000 square feet and cost $75,000 to build the structure. All said and done, the entire cost of the Cato Tabernacle was $305,000. In today's money, that is the equivalent of almost $4 million. It opened in October 1921 and the newspapers announced its grand opening. Gypsy Smith was chosen to preach at the dedication service of the new tabernacle, and 20,000 people filled the building until it was bursting at its seams. There were so many people that 10,000 were turned away from entering. Meanwhile, Cato's evangelistic business continued to grow. He had a six-figure income and a beautiful home that was attended to by servants. Cato toured from coast to coast, telling his bars to tabernacle story and in November of 1921, his evangelistic business was officially formed.
His motto was, no creed but Christ, no law but love, no book but the Bible, which gave the public appearance of a devout religious leader. Behind the scenes, however, religion quickly started to mix with politics. Secretary of State Ed Jackson was elected president of the Cato organization. Ed Jackson was a name that I remembered from my research into the Indiana Ku Klux Klan. Ed Jackson was the 32nd governor of the state of Indiana. In history records his association with the Ku Klux Klan, political scandals, and questionable activities. As the Ku Klux Klan took control of the Indiana government, Jackson was accused of favoring Klan-appointed officials. During Jackson's time in office, Klan meetings were publicized in the Indianapolis News, which was strange to me and out of character for the secretive group. As I dug through the archives, I suddenly stumbled across an article that helped me connect the dots. The Ku Klux Klan meetings in Indianapolis were held at the Cato Tabernacle. According to the newspaper accounts, the Cato Tabernacle became the meeting place for the strategic Klan operations. Even the religious meetings in the Cato Tabernacle were centered on Klan agenda, and they played Ku Klux Klan motion pictures during church services. The Ku Klux Klan was praised openly from behind the pulpit. The Imperial Wizard, Hiram Evans, held his first open meeting at the Cato Tabernacle. In an eerie glimpse into the future civil rights battles that were to come, Evans focused on the public school problem in America. It was racism. Different factions in the Klan chose the Cato Tabernacle to hold public debate. Cato's Tabernacle became so widely recognized as the Klan's official meeting place that the Klan meetings became called the Tabernacle Meetings. Klan-appointed candidates began taking seats in Indianapolis government. They were bipartisan candidates, both Democrat and Republican, with the same agenda. As Klan-appointed officials took over Indianapolis, E. Howard Cato announced his own candidacy. Like Jackson, he started under the Republican ticket but then switched to an independent candidate. The public noticed that the Indianapolis government was being replaced by Klan appointees and linked Klan candidates to the Klan meetings at the Cato Tabernacle. In the end, Cato was pushed out of his own tabernacle and the prophet branded his ministry with a design created by E. Howard Cato, right down to copying Cato's evangelistic motto. He said, we're glad to have you here. We're no denomination. We have no law but love, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. There was much to be found about E. Howard Cato, Ed Jackson, and the sudden rise and fall of the Indiana sect of the Ku Klux Klan, but they were scattered and disconnected pieces of a much larger puzzle. I wondered, how did this information fit into the prophet's real life story? I found a 1940 article in the Jeffersonville Evening Newspaper that I found to be very curious. The prophet vacated his pulpit for an entire summer. An unknown Reverend N.C. Guthrie took over the prophet's pastoral duties. The article mentioned evangelism in Milltown, Indiana, the name of a town that I remembered from recordings of the prophet. I quickly searched through the transcripts to find all of the prophet's statements about Milltown, and to my surprise, E. Howard Cato was there when the prophet was preaching at Milltown. Even stranger, when the prophet was speaking to an audience in Chicago, Illinois, he claimed that he pastored a Baptist church in Milltown. I'd already established that he was a Pentecostal minister, not Baptist, and that Milltown was just one of many stops in an evangelistic tour. Why did he want listeners to think he was a Baptist from Milltown instead of a Pentecostal from Jeffersonville, near Cato's first tabernacle chain? I found something interesting in a sermon the prophet preached in the Cato Tabernacle. Sharing the pulpit with Reverend Jim Jones of People's Temple, where he prophesied God's blessing on Jones' ministry, the prophet claimed that E. Howard Cato was looking for this day. Was the prophet alleging that Jones' involvement in the Cato Tabernacle meetings were the result of a spiritual vision from E. Howard Cato himself? The prophet returned to his own Pentecostal tabernacle 
after the summer evangelistic tour. The next year, he married his second wife, Mita Broy, in the home of Reverend Carney Carpenter. Like Cadle, Reverend Carpenter was a United Brethren Church minister. Cadle's tabernacle chain were all under the United Brethren umbrella, and the denomination did not exist in Louisville in southern Indiana until Louisville's first Cadle Tabernacle. Without Howard Cadle, there would not have been a Brethren minister in Jeffersonville to officiate their wedding. I stumbled across an article in the Nashville newspaper that I found to be interesting. In Nashville, several ministers revolted against Reverend Roy E. Davis for giving the false impression of being a United Brethren minister, and I wondered if the prophet was doing the same. According to a letter to the editor in the Tennessean, Davis was attempting to recruit Brethren Church members to his own revival. It read, Mr. Davis in this communication accused me of several things of which I wish the public to have the right conception of. A committee composed of myself and two men paid Mr. Davis a friendly visit on last Saturday night and asked him to please stop using the name of the United Brethren Church when he was advertising his meetings as he had been doing for some time. Several times he had spoke of his meetings at the old United Brethren Church, to which was confusing to the public in general. And on one occasion, an announcement came out in the paper that read as follows, Republicans of North Nashville will meet tonight at the United Brethren Church, 10th Street and Chinathayan Avenue, to organize a Hoover Club. The Reverend Roy E. Davis, pastor of the church, is heading the organization. This announcement came out in Wednesday morning's Tennessean. I felt and still feel it was not fair to me, to the United Brethren Church, or even to Mr. Davis's church, to use the name of another denomination. The background to E. Howard Cadle was very revealing, but it raised more questions than it answered. Why did the prophet choose a brethren minister for his second wedding? Was he joining forces with Cadle? Why did he claim to be a Baptist minister from Milltown? It was time to dig deeper into the prophet's early religious connections. The best place to start was by researching an evangelist that toured with the prophet starting in the 1940s. He was a man by the name of Fred Francis Bosworth.